Our gospel passage is found in John, a few verses from chapter 15, and then verses from chapter 16, found on pages 878 and 879 of your pew Bibles. Would you stand, please, as we read the gospel? Jesus said, When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you, from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. Yet none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin because they do not believe in me, about righteousness, because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer, about judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot hear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise, Praise be to you, O Christ. Christ. You may be seated. If you would, we will read the Acts passage um, for today, for Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. If you care to follow along, it's found on page 885 of your pew Bibles. As Tony said a moment ago, it is Pentecost Sunday, one of those high holy days that the church celebrates when we were preparing the confirmands for their confirmation Sunday, one of the days that we were with them, we spent talking about the church year, about the seasons of the church year. And we let them know, we helped them understand that not every day of the church year is the same. There are different, different events throughout the history of the church that we celebrate what God has done, certain events, certain things that God has done. Just as the Israelites celebrated through festivals, through feasts, we celebrate those things that God has done for us. And Pentecost ties in with the Jewish celebration of the Feast of Weeks. Um, they celebrate the giving of the harvest. When Jesus died, during the festival of Passover, the first fruit of the harvest, of a grain harvest, was brought to the temple and lifted up to God. And now, 50 days later, seven weeks later from that day, the rest of the harvest has been gathered, and that's the wheat. The barley or corn was first. The wheat was last. And from that harvest, loaves of bread were baked and lifted up to God. The remainder of the harvest, Jesus as the first fruit, and the church, the harvest of God being brought in, the church of the living God. Let's read together from Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, 
They were all together in one place. And suddenly, from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared on them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They're drunk. They're filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is an odd passage, isn't it? Sometimes I think we're a little afraid to admit when we read something odd in Scripture. But imagine if these events had happened to you. Would you have even told anyone about them? Or would you have just kept silent for fear that people might have thought you were a little loony? But something happened that prevented the disciples from keeping silent. They had to speak out. They were speaking the mighty deeds of God. You know, many times I've heard this passage, and people will begin to explain and say, well, 120 people, and they, they get that from Acts 1, 120 people joining in the upper room, were together praying and fasting. Some will say they've been fasting for the 10 days from the time that Jesus ascended to heaven. We don't know for certain. We do know for certain that they were in Jerusalem. Scripture makes that plain. And we do know for certain that there were 12 disciples there. Because Scripture says Peter stood up to speak and the 11 disciples were with him. Does that strike anyone as strange? Twelve disciples. One was missing. 
right? But if you look in Acts chapter 1, after a time of prayer, Peter said, it's time for us to replace Judas with another one. One who has been with us since Jesus was baptized. One that's been with us all along. From the beginning, the words that Jesus used in John, in the Gospel of John we just read. And so they choose one named Matthias. You know, we read that and we think, ah, you know, big deal. So they chose another disciple. But do you think that might have been important? Twelve is an important number in Scripture. It's the number of the fulfillment of God's promises to his people. And it's also the number of God's people. It represents all of God's people. We think of the 12 tribes of Israel, and we do think of the 12 apostles. And in many ways, the 12 apostles were priests or ministers that represented the 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus said in the passage in John that he would send the advocate. The promise of the Father is what Luke calls it. The power of God from on high. And so, when the Spirit of God came upon these 12 disciples, it was evidence of God fulfilling his promises to the nation of Israel. Remember, he had said, I'm going to give you a new covenant, a covenant that's written on the heart, not one that's written on tablets of stone. And this was the beginning of that covenant. He had also said from the beginning to his people, Israel, when he brought them out of Egypt, I want you to be a priest, a nation of priests to the world. And in this way, they would begin to fulfill their call or actually complete their call to be a nation of priests unto the world because they would begin to take the gospel out to the ends of the earth. One of the reasons that they were gathered together is because Jesus said, the power of the Spirit will make you witnesses. In Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That was the purpose of the Spirit. That the kingdom of God might be taken to the ends of the earth. The kingdom of God which transforms the world. So we know there were 12 there. Could there have been more? Quite possibly. I wonder if one of the reasons that Luke uses the phrase or the word they were together in one place is not to specify anyone else, but to leave it open even to us. As we read the scripture, can we put ourselves there, receiving the power of God's Spirit? Where were they? Were they in an upper room? Were they in, a, in the temple? We don't know. We know that wherever they were, the way that it, the coming of God's Spirit is described is as a wind a violent, rushing wind. It's as if they were saying, you know, we were together, we were praising God, we were praying, and something happened. And the only way I know to explain it is wind that we all felt, that we all heard, that we all saw. We know that God came. It takes us back, actually, to Exodus, when the law was given by Moses. It was given to Moses, who gave it to the people on Mount, at Mount Sinai. And if you read Exodus 19, the presence of God is described on the top of Mount Sinai as thunder and lightning, the sound of a trumpet, a smoky cloud. 
on the top of that mountain. That is a metaphor for the presence of God. They knew God was there, and they knew God was doing something. In the same way, those that were gathered that day, on the day of Pentecost, knew that God was there and that God was doing something. We know that there was evidence that God had come with his spirit. What was that evidence? They began speaking in languages they didn't know. As if the spirit might come upon us here in the same way and we might begin to speak in German or Russian or Spanish or Italian, languages that we might never have learned. And what purpose did that serve? Those that heard gathered outside wondering, what is this? This strange sound. Were they drawn to the sound of wind? Were they drawn to the sound of people speaking in their own languages? It just says this brought them. We don't really know what this is. It could have been and probably was both. But they heard Peter speaking, or all of these disciples speaking, the mighty deeds of God. And they're described there, those that gathered as devout Jews. Who were they? They were probably those who followed Jewish law, who either lived in Jerusalem or had come from all of the nations that we named, those nations representing all of the known world in that time. They had come to celebrate Pentecost in Jerusalem. And they hear this strange noise, and they hear about God's mighty deeds. And what we don't read today, as the scripture goes on, from that speech, from that sermon that Peter preaches, they say, what are we supposed to do? And Peter says, repent and believe. And they do. And it says about 3,000 were added to the church that day. So what's going on here in this odd passage? We have evidence of the Spirit working. So we have to ask ourselves, if God promises the Spirit of God to each of us, what is the evidence of God's Spirit working in my life? Could we actually sit down and name the evidence of God's Spirit working in our lives? One of the words used in the first verse is that these who were there were together in one place. And that word, another translation says, in one accord. They were of the same mind, of the same passion. They had a common interest that they held together. What was that? Jesus had said, wait. Wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. Wait so that you might be clothed with power from on high. And he tells them the reason. So that you might be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Do you think that might have anything to do with 
us. And what are the ends of the earth? There, that, passion, or that phrase, in one accord, is used ten times in Acts. It's used primarily for the times that God's people are together, praising God, fellowshipping with communion and in meals together, hearing the gospel preached. There's another time that it's used when Stephen is being stoned in Acts chapter 7. It says those that held the stones rushed upon Stephen in one accord. They were passionate about something and they wanted to silence the voice of this one that spoke about God. Another time that phrase is used is in Acts 19, in Ephesus. The draw to Ephesus was the temple of Artemis, or the temple of Diana, one of the great uh, seven wonders of the ancient world. The artisans in Ephesus made idols that they sold in the temple of Diana. That's how they made their money. And along comes Paul, who begins to preach that gods made with hands are not gods. He comes preaching the kingdom of God. Well, they didn't like that because that interrupted their business. People stopped buying the things that they were making. And so Acts says that in one accord, these artisans, they took forcefully two of Paul's companions and rushed into the temple. They were passionate about something. Does our passion for the kingdom of God translate into compassion for God's people? Are we so passionate about God's kingdom that we show compassion for God's people. Compassion means to suffer with people. How do we do that? What does that look like? How do we know that the Spirit of God is working in our lives? In John Wesley's diaries, there is um, communication, letters recorded uh, written between a lady who had become a member of the Methodist societies and John Wesley. She was a wealthy lady, educated, which was odd for the 1700s, for a lady to be educated. And so she began exchanging letters with John Wesley, and it was obvious to him that she, was, she wanted her faith to grow. But as their communication continued, he became a little worried because she said, you know, being a part of this Methodist movement, I'm having to associate with people who are not like I am. People who maybe not, are maybe not of good character. People who are poor. She didn't like that. She said, Christians should fellowship with people who are of good taste and good character. To which Wesley replies, I know many poor people who have good taste and good character and many rich people who don't have any at all. And he said, besides, they may not have taste, but they do have souls. And perhaps you can help them see the kingdom of God. For Wesley, true compassion was a sincere encounter with people who were different from us. 
to the ends of the earth. If the lady had gone to do what John Wesley had strongly suggested, she would have gone to the home to visit the poor, which is what John Wesley continually told his Methodist movement. Visit the poor. Go to their homes. Go to where they are. Why would we expect them to come to where we are? Go to the ends of the earth. To her, that would have been the ends of the earth. Whether she went or not, we don't know. We never are told. What is the evidence of the Spirit of God working in our lives? Are we willing to go to the ends of the earth? In the early days of the nation of Israel, community was everybody. Community was the rich, the poor, the widow, the orphan, the stranger. Who are the strangers in our lives? Are we willing to go to the ends of the earth for the kingdom of God? Because it's only the kingdom of God that will transform the world. Pentecost came to be for the Jewish nation in the time of Jesus. It came to be a celebration of God's giving of the law on Mount Sinai. God's law written on our hearts. Do you remember the story of the Tower of Babel in Genesis? Immediately after the flood, God made a covenant with Noah, with the earth. And then he said to Noah, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The next event is the Tower of Babel. The people began to set out. They started moving east. But they came upon a plain in Babylon, probably. And they thought, hmm, this looks good. We like this. Let's build a city here. Not only a city, but let's build a tower all the way up to heaven. So they began to work. And scripture says they had one language. They could understand each other. They were in one accord. And God comes down and says, well, if they can do this, they can do anything in one accord. Are we doing what we do for the kingdom of God? Or are we doing what we do for ourselves? And so God's solution was to confuse their languages and to scatter them so that they would begin to do what he told them to do in the first place. And on the day of Pentecost, in many ways we see that Tower of Babel in reverse. God joins his people together in one language, by his Spirit, for the reason that we may be scattered again to the ends of the earth. What does that look like to you? Could it be the checkout person at the grocery store? Have you ever bothered to call one by name? Their daughters, their sons, their mothers, their fathers, just like we are. They're people. Are we willing to reach out beyond what is familiar to us 
for the kingdom of God. When the disciples received the Spirit, they could have stayed in that room, wherever they were. They could have sat there and said, wow, isn't this great? Let's just sit here and enjoy this together. But Jesus had said, to the ends of the earth. So what does that look like to you? To me? Who's the stranger in your life? Are we willing to reach out beyond what is familiar for the kingdom of God? Is the language that we're speaking about ourselves or about what God is doing. Amen.